This playthrough is rated T for teen. Hey, get your Cthulhu out of my D&D. Greetings and salutations, viewers. Well, now we're back here with another episode of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. In the last episode, we went through Dragon Spear Castle and through the caverns. Well, through the castle dungeon part itself, and now we're in the caverns, closer to our quarry and the, the blazing brazier or the fire-breathing brazier, whatever. It's some brazier, some MacGuffin we have to grab, so... Let's continue on through this, but uh, you'll find out what I'm talking about here later. Oh, we got some traps. Got some poison mushrooms. Uh, the diamond body would probably be useful, but, uh, oh well. And we got bats here that are flaming bats. Now they're dead bats. Da 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 da. Nice. Yeah. Seems like this whole area is pretty, I wouldn't say easy, but a little bit nicer just because of the hole being a little stunned. But, you know, we're back in a classic, uh, Dungeon Heights. What the heck is that thing? Uh, yeah, those are ropers. Those are, uh, bom um, not abominations. Um, oh, what's, what's the term for them again? I forgot. Basically, they're underground, uh, stalag, uh, mites that, uh, well, usually they have, like, tentacles and stuff like that, but for whatever reason, they decided to just make them shoot, like, spinies at you or something like that, so. Um, yeah, they're usually in the underground, usually like uh, when you go in the underdark is what a, in D&D &D is where you just go to the underground and it's this whole, you know, caveway society, you know, if you go down deep enough, maybe hit the center of the earth. Okay, maybe not that much, but, but yeah, there's uh, all types of creepy crawlies in this place, nasty critters that usually is pretty alien, kind of like if you go to the, the bottom of the ocean, that type of situation. Yeah, ropers usually, usually are on, usually more stalactites than mites, but... Uh, either way, they're just creatures that blend in with the area, and then they, when they find people they can eat, you know, they rope them up with their tentacles and pull them up tight to eat them. But uh, in this case, as enemies, they're just having them shoot uh, projectiles at you. For As far as I'm aware, ropers can't do that, so... Oh well. I mean, it's not like you have to be exactly true. There could be variations to ropers. It's just kind of weird that they just have them be... And it was like drow are getting involved. In this case, uh, driders. Driders are basically usually male, sometimes female, drow that have been cursed by the Spider Queen because of some transgressions they did against her. So they've been cursed to have um, spider bodies and keep their you know normal humanoid body t uh, t the tops and the bottoms are spiders. So pretty, they're more monstrous now. Some of them keep their intelligence, but for the most part, they've returned mainly into monstrosities. And like everything else, they can usually be stunned. Yeah, they tend to use uh, um, bows and arrows when fighting. Even in, actually, which in the in the books they can use melee, but they do tend to range you before they get in close. Um, I think they can also poison from their spider part of their bodies, if I recall. Like they can do webs and all the other stuff like a spider is. So yeah, Wolf is not a not a, a god to be trifled with if you worship her. Don't. You? Don't piss her off, otherwise you'll become cursed to be one of these things. I don't use Driders too much in uh, my games. Maybe I should... Then again, I don't use Drow very much either, even though I like the concept of Drow. And they're perfect villains. It's just, I don't know, I just tend not to use them very often as a common enemy. But they're, if you're looking for a campaign where uh, you got a pretty good villain, Drow and Driders are pretty pretty solid. Although D&D &D nowadays likes to make it to where, you know, at least official sources like to make it where it's only like the rare few. They're, they're trying to go away from whole cultures of creatures being evil. But the reason it was designed like that is so you'd have an encounter or an enemy to fight. So it's just easier to say all things in this are evil. Now if you make a D&D &D campaign that, that's different, that's fine. It's just, you know... The, original, the, the idea for the original source materials is supposed to give people who maybe don't want to make like a, all the, do like all the game design themselves and they just want something to rely on, then that's what the official material is for. And it's supposed to give, you know, people running the game ideas or at least uh, at least say, oh, okay, these are these are common tropes. We'll use this these ideas for the game. But now, if you buy most modern stuff, they try to stay away from those terms. They've even tried. I've heard they've even tried to make beholders seem. Not as evil as they once were. Like, what the heck, man? Beholders are supposed to be like, you know, evil sons of, sons of guns. You know, they hate their own kind too. Like, they're so they're so evil and petty that they'll even uh, like hurt harm their own kind because they're they're they think so highly of themselves. 
but now they're trying to tone them down. I'm like, well, that just makes them boring for being eye tyrants that are floating eyeballs with eight eye stalks and a big one with a big giant eye, you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm a big fan of, like, having an interesting lore with monsters and creatures and stuff like that. And then when they all get sanitized, it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of boring. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I talked about this last episode. I'm bringing it up again, so. Sorry, sometimes when I get on, when an idea or certain concept gets stuck in my head, like, or something I get frustrated about, I'm just like, I bring it up over and over and over again, even though that's not what people are watching for, so I'll try to keep my mind out of it, so. But anyway, Driders and, and, oh yeah, Boulders would be, well, they're not down here in this game, because the Beholder, actually, Beholder in the first game was actually a lot, lot bigger than Beholders are supposed to be. He was, like, huge, like, someone cast a large person spell on him or something like that, you know? I got more ropers here. Unless I call them something different, but these are supposed to be ropers. Um, yeah, the Underdark has a lot of crazy creatures in it, just because they basically can design it however they want, do whatever they want, it makes sense, you know, because, you know, the Underdark, Underdark is, you know, away from light and all sources like that, so you can do anything designed by them. Yeah, I'm just gonna cry, chop these riders. Even though realistically I'd probably have trouble if I was doing this by myself. But we are playing heroes, so we always gotta be, you know, big, burly, and, uh, and massive compared to these villains. I might need to go back. I am kind of skipping over a couple of different passageways, so don't hit me with bow and arrow. Actually, usually when Drowned Riders hit you with ranged combat, they're usually shooting, like, specialized darts or, or crossbows that are designed to either paralyze or, or poison you so you can't get away from them, that type of thing. And usually... Uh, Drow will uh, take you as well, depending on the situation. If you're too weak, they'll just straight up kill you. If you're somewhat uh, competent or or strong, they, they might capture you and make you a slave. Same with genies and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so you better be careful if you're playing, if you're using a uh, fighting against Drow in uh, D and D. Well, I guess it depends on the well, if it's a video game or how your DM likes to run things. It definitely does change depending on who's running the game, obviously, because, you know, obviously different people have different ide concepts or different ideas of what's important to the game. Whether you have a story-based D&D uh, &D game or if you have just a monster, kill all the monsters kind of kind of game, which those can be fine, too, if you just want to use all your stats and do that. I'm more of a... Ow. I'm more of a story-based DM guy. I like to have, you know, nothing complicated, just a simple story. Like, you fight creatures and all this other stuff, but there has to be some overarching plot. You know, I like doing campaigns. I guess that'd be the the best ex or, uh, best explanation. Campaigns are usually when it's just a whole bunch of adventures uh, together that, whoops. Um, let's switch back to that. I don't think I, okay. Yeah, it just ties all in together. Um, okay, just messing with my stuff there. Um, yeah, a campaign is just a series of ventures that have an overarching plot that tie into each other. But some people like just doing one shots or or episodic episodes where each episode, you know, you fight a monster or whatever, but it doesn't really tie into the main plot. There might be like one element that does, but overall, you could you don't have to tie them all together. It really depends on the group you play as if that's important. Um, I like campaigns, but if but for some people, then maybe they just like doing like one shot adventures. You know, like an episode of Star Trek is a good example of what you mean, like a one shot. Like, there's an overarching story, but a lot of episodes could be considered solo endeavors and not have to be counted for the main overarching story of the show or whatever, you know. Usually, episodic is better if you're doing, if you're playing with friends and you're only doing like one shots, you know, where you only get to play once in a while and you just, or you play different games every time you get together. The only problem with doing that is learning a whole new system to play as, which is probably why nowadays when I get younger, I always prefer easier, less complicated systems, especially if I want to try out different gaming systems. It means I don't have to force my players to learn a whole new combat system. You know, I don't want to have like 50 games that are like Pathfinder, where it requires like a, a crap ton of numbers and like all these things you have to do to mid-max your character. You know, I like that stuff when I was younger, and I still like that stuff, but you know. Um, Let's see, sorry, this bat just not one to take the punishment it deserves. Stupid bat. No one likes bats, even though they're not actually vampiric or really nasty creatures, but we've been led to believe otherwise. Um, but yeah, I prefer systems, or at least, you know, you can do something cool with it, but it's not super complicated. Just because, like I said, you only have so much time, and 
you know, like I said, we've got, I've got a lot, got a life outside of D&D, &D, you know, believe it or not. Not much of a life, but I still do. Man, I can keep getting shoved around because of the drider and the, the ropers here. I think it's kind of, I, I do think it's kind of cool they brought in ropers. Most, a lot of people don't use ropers in D&D, despite them being kind of a classic monster in a sense. Not classic like goblins or anything like that, but, but not too many adventurers go into the Underdark, so you don't get to use ropers on a very regular occasion. I use them every once in a while, but I use them more as, as a trap more than a straight-up encounter, just because of what they do. They just pretend to be saliva mines or tights, and then they, bam, try to get you. I'm trying to see if these are male driders or female driders. I think they're male driders. Usually, most driders are cursed uh, male drow in most cases. There's a few female driders, but, it's, well, not as common. Because the lore indicates it's usually the men who get kind of screwed in drow society. Because it's matriarchal in nature. So, most of the women get, uh, get um, stations of power and are the magical. Usually, they're clerics or wizards and stuff like that. Usually, male drow, at least in most stories are usually end up being just fighters and rogues and stuff like that. Um, not saying they can't get power, but it's very rare. You know, like I said, they're usually uh, relegated to grunts and uh, army types and, you know, being part of the, the combat forces, if anything like that. So, and, you know, there's the, uh, I was about to say, I thought I saw something glowing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not much I can do with that with that, and I haven't been updating my, my diamond body, so I can poison way too easily. It's just, it's such a non-threat, you know, like, to get poisoned in this game. I mean, it's annoying to stint, but not that annoying. It's more dangerous to get straight up pure damage uh, hit uh, smack onto you than anything. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like their, their uh, range attack tends to have a bit of a uh, stunning effect. Because every once in a while, it'll knock me back if it hits me enough. I've noticed I haven't had it blocked very much while I'm dead down here. Mainly because I because everyone here is stunnable, so. Oop, we've made it to the uh, boss of this encounter. Alright, let's take a save and go inside. Hopefully hopefully you're you're a fan of seafoods, folks. Stop. Come here like that. Do not resist. Submit. Your will is my will. Your thoughts are like water to me. Ah, Jerk. Yes. Come to me. I am your friend and master. Jerk has given you a new task. To serve me. A strong mind. I cannot control this animal. Kill him, my pet. I'm not up for Calamari, and it's boss time against Ilkathoth. Ilkathoth? <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, it's a Mind Flayer or Illithid, depending on which version of the game you're playing as. Mind Flayers are basically um, creeps, well, depending on which world or which game you're playing as. They're either from outer space or they're from the Underdark. They're, squid they're creatures with squid like heads. Um, they can use psionics, which is basically tele tele telepathy and every other sort of things. Um, she specifically can spew her ink at you, which uh, can stun you, I believe. Uh, can also blind you. Basically just makes it harder for you to hit. Luckily, I can still use potions while... Um, and yeah, Zatara, these Black Knights or Zintarum soldiers are down here while we're fighting her. Um, yeah, she can also use magic. Uh, I think Magic Mills is the only real spell outside of her uh, her ink, ink breath or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, her, she's kind of annoying because of her you know, ability to possibly stun me. Ah! Oh! Ouch! Good thing I saved it. Alright, let's try that again, folks. Man, I got a bit unlucky there. Actually, yeah, she must have crit me a few times. Good thing I saved it, so... Oh well, sometimes you make mistakes. Let's try that again. Luckily, you can just skip through the cutscene and straight to the battle. So, all right, just uh, skip that. Yeah, unfortunately, like I said, she's kind of annoying because her ability to stun you is a uh, is quite obnoxious. Oh, I, you keep thinking I'm out of her range, but then she hits she hits me. 
I mean, there's a possibility I don't get stunned either. It's really kind of a based off my saves. So you almost wanna you wanna like drag out her. Actually, I could go. I should could try doing a my bow and arrow. See if I can get a some kills that way. I don't have to hit her. Oh, you're right. The guys can block. Ah, yeah. Better just like, smack the stun and smack. Him. I just have to be be prepared for a uh, to heal. I'm gonna be using quite a few potions in this fight because of her stunning. Me. Yeah, I don't I don't like when I get stunned. It doesn't feel good now, does it? Yeah. Yeah, she's uh, basically if you're playing the monk, she basically gives you a taste of your own medicine. You're like, I love stunning, but I don't like getting stunned. It's not fair. And yeah, because the Zentarum soldiers, or whatever you want to call them, they, they can range attack you. I just have to be careful getting too close, because she does do that, like, yeah, that this ability, which is what killed me before. Ow. Yeah, she got a good crit on me. Yeesh. I mean, as soon as I can focus on her, I can block and all this other stuff. I just have to... There we go. Now you're dead. Ooh. Never mind that. That's not working. That didn't work too well. All right, so blocking is out. So ranged it is. Yeah, one of the few times where ranged is probably better against a type of person like this. Even though she can do like stunning and all this other stuff, it's still better to like hit her with a bow. This is why I always wanted to have a bow. Nah. Luckily, paralyzing doesn't do that much damage, and that ability only is only useful when the, she has her allies with her, but yeah, we can just range attack her. This is why I always keep a bow on me, just in case. The Brazier of Eternal Flame. You recovered the Brazier of Eternal Flame, a bronze bowl inlaid with Jacinth runes for the body of Ulkaloth. It should be returned to Jarek and Baldur's Gate. So. Usually, usually mind flayers are like, you know, can't, well, maybe not campaign, but they're usually major bosses. The fact that she's just a ra random person we run across on our journey is just kind of surprising, really, when you think about it. I don't think there's anything else in here. I probably could have beaten her without dying, but I didn't, since I just saved it, I didn't want to, like, um, uh, like, reload and try to do it without dying, you know, like, edit it to where I somehow did it in one shot, you know. Because sometimes it just happens like that. Sometimes you just make a mistake and you, know, you get killed. This is why there's a save spot right before the boss. So. I don't think there's anything else actually in here. So, but Yeah, uh, yeah, they're either aliens because they were also introduced in Spelljammer, which is a... Uh, Spelljammer was D&D. &D. The cell door opens. Whatever mysterious force that held the cell door closed has seemingly disappeared. The door swings open freely as if it was never locked. So you can grab your treasure here. Lost boots, money... And we can get a... Yeah, if you aren't paying attention, there's actually an escape route here. So, return to the surface. Um, yeah, they're they're either aliens or just from a creature from the Underdark. And yeah, they look like Cthulian horrors. Um, oh yeah, we got that Tempest amulet in the last episode. So we can give it to uh, uh, the Tempest soldier over here that told asked us to get that for him. So why not? We'll get a bit of a reward for that. I was actually trying to get to the sprint. Um, and yeah, their big thing is other than all the abilities I talked about there, they're usually powerful magic users. And the one big thing is after they paralyze you with like magic or something like that, one of the favorite things they do is they'll wrap their tentacles around their head and rip your brain out. So yeah, that's fun. Greetings. Oh, that I thought you were gonna say something else. So um, I found this I found this holy symbol, Tempest, in the halls below. So it returns, but alas, not with the priest who once carried. I ask that you take this as a reward. May Tempest be with you. Oh, may Tempest be with you, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, you get a remarkable flashing battle axe. That doesn't help me. I mean, I could use that, I guess, but we get 2,000 experience. Yeah, I'm going to break down that axe, but... Oh, I actually didn't want to level up yet. Uh, I'll do that here in a second. Uh, let's see. Remarkable ba flashing battle axe. Uh, Prude crits and combat reflexes, but I can't equip it because I am not a character that can use that type of weapon so that's more for i think borador can use it and adorn for sure um maybe alicia but yeah unfortunately it's i just had to break it down because i'm not gonna be able to or just sell it straight up um okay anyway level up let's see we're hit level 18 man we're already at epic level so technically we should have we should be you know be fighting like uh, dragons or something like that so um but oh well 
we're, well, actually, we were fighting dragons. Well, technically, we did run across the dragon. So, yeah. We're, uh, in D&D, &D, epic levels are level 20, by the way. So, uh, okay. Anyway. Let's see. What do I want to put? Uh, let's see. And our combat's good. Willpower is not something I immediately need. So toughness, we're good there. Uh, could get my stunning blow back up a bit. Let's see. Uh, piercing stride, that's not as big of a deal. I mean, I could do Iron Will, it's just I'm not using magic that much. Um, yeah, I could upgrade Fortitude. I think I could get Endurance so I can uh, stop taking as much damage from that. Or at least re resist the effects. So, let's see what's that one. Yeah, that's the unarmed damage. Oh, yeah, I could max out my proficiency. I might do that next level. Uh, yeah, let's do Evasion. So, Evasion and maybe some Diamond Body. At least put a point into that. Yeah, let's get evasion down first just because of magic and all that, so. Okay, we're out on that. Yeah, let's get uh yeah, let's get uh deflect missiles going there, so. And uh diamond body. This is endurance requires oh, requires too, huh? Okay, anyway. Alright, let's head back to town. I guess I don't have to use a a, a potion, because I could just run out of town while I'm here, so. Run, run, as fast as you can, or you'll be well done. But yeah, Dragon Spear Castle is a pretty... I like the environment of Dragon Spear Castle, but because the monsters are easy to send, it's not as a... Uh, uh, what's the word? I mean, it's a, it's still a nice place to go to and everything like that. It's just, uh, it's it's rather simple to go through. I mean, the dangerous part is the final bit where we fight, fight the Mind Flare because of our ability to poly, uh, stun you and everything like that, so... Welcome. Yeah, let's go ahead and break down that Battle Axe. Break it down. Break, 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 break it down. Uh, okay. Flaws. Yeah, that's the same. So we can sell that. I know I get more money for just straight up selling if I don't care about that. But getting the gemstones is actually cheaper to do it that way than buying the gemstone later on. So, ooh, uh, flawless. Yeah, what's a uh, better, better chain boots? So, Did you notice I got in those? So. Welcome. Yeah, sell that. Yeah. So if you don't see something here, sell a couple of those. Yeah, I'm just gonna sell a few of those too. And so was that the second ring? Yeah, that was the second ring. Okay. Sell the rest of these. Oh, we got enough general heal and potions. I can sell these lessers now. And we'll sell that ring. Okay, got an emerald. Nice. Okay. You'll find all right, let's go back to Jarek and tell him we got that so we can get on to the next MacGuffin. And that'll be that'll be it, won't it? Yeah, one more MacGuffin and we'll be good to go. So, all right. Making good progress. The chapter's going by a lot faster than I expected. I think it's because I'm, I'm not, like, taking forever on, like, one section and having to, like, run away and heal and all this other stuff. So, all right, Jarek, what do you got for me now? The priests of Tempest must have been sad to see you leave the halls of Dragonspear Castle. You recovered the brazier of eternal flame? Good. Here, your reward. Gain three thousand experience or three thousand gold and four thousand experience for giving of the brazier. Alright, tell me about the oceanic urn now. The oceanic urn is an aquamarine studded golden urn, last seen in the hands of pirates based out of Seer's Cove. One of Rendala's ships could get you there, though you'd have to row ashore yourself. I'll return when I have the oceanic urn. Farewell. All right, final, uh, final uh, MacGuffin. So let's head on there. So, Rondalia, huh? Well, let's see if she can help me with that or not. Perhaps she can. She can. Now let's go. Oh nope, I don't want to go to Church of Helm because he can't do anything for me. Nope, only Alessia can do something with that. Yeah, we've already finished our, our side quest character, so not much else to really be done with that, so. Greetings again, adventurer. I know, I guess she doesn't do anything for us. Yeah, for whatever reason, she says something about having Rondalia well met again, uh, helping with that. And, yeah, but yet we don't actually have to do anything with her. We can just leave afterwards. So I wanted to show off, you know, what happens if you try to go talking to her about it. It's like, nope, we don't have to do anything about that. We just... We just head on over there on our own accord, so. You don't have anything for me, Captain Nagura, do you? See if you have any new dialogue. Greetings. Nope. Okay. Cool. 
Yeah, unfortunately, NPCs only have so much lines of dialogue, and then, I mean, the whole game is adventure, so obviously, they're not that big of a deal. So, yep, Tennessee, no extra things for no reason to go to Skull Gorge. So, all right, time to go to the Sea Cave. The Nakamatsu Sphere spell can clear enemy of enemy area of enemies. All right, looks like we're in a sea cave of some sort. On to the sea. On to the sea. Noah is let out. Down here it's better. Take it from me. I don't remember the whole song. It's been forever since I watched that movie. da 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 On to the sea. I, I remember the general gist of the song. Yeah, it's been a hot minute since I've watched those types of old movies. Then again, I don't watch as much old uh, movies in general nowadays. I don't know why. Just something about... Oh, yeah, we can return to the ship if we want to row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. I remember that movie, so uh, that song so recently just because of... Uh, was it... Uh, was it uh, Star Trek V? Was it Star Trek V? No... Or was it four? No, I think it was five. Anyway, we got a... Uh, I think these are... Oh. Actually, I forgot to switch, switch it to stun. That's why... And they're doing a ton of damage to me. Ow! Yeah, these guys are... These guys step it up a notch. That's for dang sure. Come on down. Slide on down so I can stun you. Ah, these guys are really bashing me. Holy crap. I forgot how... I forgot how, like, next step damage these guys are. Alright, then you do. Yeah, like, separate these guys. Whew. Yeah, problem with the... Problem with the... Oh, did you actually not get stunned? Oh, that's right. I think you're technically undead. They're like undead zombie pirates, I think. Yeah, see, I can't stun them. Yeah, see, we got a, a section where we're going to stun people, and now we're back to a section where we can't stun people. Uh, this game just likes to pull on my heartstrings. It knew it wanted to give me a challenge at one point, so it's like, you know what? That blast area was way too easy for you. Yeah, see how I'm not stunning when I... So, back to, uh... Back to crushing blow. Oh, God. I don't too many of them. Oh, my God. These guys hit so hard. Yeah, Monk is awesome, but there's just some enemies that just, just teach our lesson. That's for dang sure. Yeah, I just have to play this a little, a little bit differently now. So, yeah, we're going back to how I was when I was uh, played the wizard. I had to like, I had to play it safe, because yeah, they kept hitting me like really badly. Maybe I should have upgraded my uh, proficiency, my armor proficiency, so I could actually take a, so I raise my AC a bit more. But what is my AC at right now? 85? Eh, never, it's never enough. Never, never, never. Like how the CK ha sea cave has like, you know, uh, like a uh, reef or whatever, a coral in the, in the... Oh, stop blocking. Stop it. <laughs> then we can play this game all day, guys. Hey, oh, they get a bit quick with their blocks. And unfortunately, for, even though they're undead, they actually move decently fast. So I don't get a really good chance to, like, range attack them. If they were, like, regular zombies. Or if I had uh, the uh, turn undead ability, I could get them to get off my back. This is one of those areas that Alicia is a little bit better. There are certain characters that tend to do better in certain dungeons than other ones. I do like the fact that that is kind of designed like that. So, like, if you have fleshy characters, then people like, you know, Viadra are really good in those dungeons. But then in other dungeons, she might have a bit more trouble because she's a bit... Despite everything, she is squishy when it comes to her HP. You know, Doran is the better frontline fighter when it comes to that. I mean, technically, Doran is the main frontline fighter, and then Viadra is the second main frontline fighter. Actually, no, I guess that'd be Alyssa because of her heavy armor and healing and stuff like that. So, monks have always been a secondary frontline fighter. They've never been main frontline fighters just because they're usually not as durable as a fighter is because they don't get the same HP pool. As a fighter, usually fighters will get anywhere from like a D10 to like a D12, while uh, monks will get like a D6 to a D8, depending on which version you're playing. And that is enough, not enough HP 
at later levels to like handle fighting like really you know frontline enemies. There. Oh, I'm out of. Uh, oops. I actually just need to heal. Oh well. I hate when I do that. I, I always like will randomly forget like which um, which button is the uh, the rejuvenation thing. Yeah, this one might not be. Go I might not go through the sea cave as fast as I did the previous area because of because of that because of these guys being a bit bit uh, chunky. I just, oh. Yeah, since uh, since there was only one there, I didn't mind going a bit more bombastic with him, punching him in the throat and all this other stuff. So if there if there's multiple ones there, then I then I kind of calm down and block and all that other stuff, but in this case, eh, let's go this way. Luckily there's no holes we can't get out of here. Oh, come on now. There we go. And Rock Roll Great X, gotta sell that. Pull some dough. Dough, 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 dough. I don't usually tend to use like uh, C or C caves very often in my campaigns. I don't know why. I mean, I can use, uh, I can make pirate adventures. It's just usually C adventures don't last very long. If I do ever run them, it's only probably one or two adventures. There's like something on the C, and then it's right back to land. And a lot of players don't like playing on the C because, you know, I, I tend to like use the environment against my players. So a lot of times you'll, uh, if there's gonna be the C, I'm always gonna try everything I can to knock him into the water. Because usually fighting in water in D&D is kind of obnoxious to do because you get all these disadvantages. Because unless you're an actual fish or a mer person, well, or merman or whatever, fighting in the water, you're not gonna you're not gonna do well fighting. I think if I remember correctly, you have to use a piercing weapon underwater because if it's slashing or bludgeoning, it doesn't move as quickly because you know resistance and all that from uh, you know hitting it through the water. So if it's like a spear, you'll be fine. And obviously, it's like you're obviously in the water. You're, you're acting like you're under heavy gravity or something like that, so you're not as quick as you normally would be. So yeah, all these bonuses. But depending on which group you play with or what magic they've got across, they'll usually try to find ways or as soon as they can to get water breathing, so they don't have to. So they don't have to mess with that. So or at least they don't have to worry about breathing. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Breathing underwater. So if you're fighting underwater, you can only you can only be underwater for so many turns before you start drowning. You know, which means you might. Uh, and if you're fighting, which means you're exerting energy, which means you know you're uh, you're not your your energy is going to be out, so you can't hold your breath as easier. So yeah, just burn, baby, burn. Too bad my burn my burn tick damage isn't as much, mainly because I've only got a plus one version of my flame weapon, so it's not doing as much as I'd like. But at higher levels, the tick damage is more more. So all right, I think we're. I think we might be at a good stopping point here pretty soon. I'll wait till we get. I guess I could have stopped at that save spot. I usually just like going a little bit more just because usually this game, there's only so much story content or whatever before we go on to the next dungeon. So, And I usually want to get a decent amount of uh, play time out of it, especially if I take forever in a dungeon. Although Dragon Spear, I probably could have just finished that if I really played a little bit longer, but that's why I'm playing. That's why I didn't just straight up end the episode after beat, beating the Mind Flayer. Ooh. Yeah, you guys are way too fast for, like, freaking zombies. You're like uh, red zombies from Resident Evil, the remake. The ones where you, uh, the ones if you don't uh, burn, they'll come back later in the game, which is really annoying. That actually made the game a lot more dangerous than the original one. I still like the original one a little bit better than the remake, but the remake is really good. Like, it really is. Like, they really did a good job. Re like, they made it, obviously they made the game more serious than Goofy. You know, more than less than like a B tier movie or something like that, but they did a really good job re revamping it. I'll have to play that one of these days. I was thinking about doing that next for when I play Halloween, but I was almost considering doing Resident Evil 5 because I, I think technically the Resident Evil remake came out before 5, though. I was trying to do them in a semi order, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what mood I'm in if I want to play the the craptacular 5, which 5 is still better than 6, that's for sure. And yet, six is like one of the better-selling Resident Evils. Just messed up because of how how much I don't. I mean, I don't hate the game. I mean, there's something enjoyable in like how stupid it is, but 
you know, I, it definitely is not on the same level as the original Resident Evil. At least in my case. I don't know why I'm talking about Resident Evil when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's because I don't want to. I don't want to put too many D and D stories. Um, I want to save some D and D stories for. Although I'll probably the way uh, the way my brain works, I'll probably end up repeating some of these again if I ever play like Baldur's Gate or something. Like that. But yeah, I mean that's the case of being old. You'll just randomly do that. So, all right, save spot, and there's so many more to go. What awaits us in the sea cave? Will we uh, will we get rust on our weapons? Will the undead have us for dinner? And what about the fish and water in this place? Find out next time in the next episode of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you next time.